fracture surgery and tendon surgery. Um, he's a professor of surgery at Dalhousie University in Canada and the president of the Canadian Society for Surgery of the Hand. And he has been developing and pioneering these techniques um, throughout his career and we're honored to be taught by him today. So thank you very much, Dr. Lalonde. Thank you so much. Uh, fracture treatment and tendency. So uh, last week we talked about how to do it. This week we're going to talk about why it's useful to do it and in what situations and how to get better results in fracture and tendon surgery in general. Uh, so one of the real, the two real problems in flexor tendon repair are stiff fingers, right? We all get stiff fingers and the tendons get stuck. And the second problem that we get is that we get ruptures of our flexor tendon repairs. And Wallant has taught us a lot about rupture and how to avoid rupture. And so those are the things that I really want to help you with because I got to tell you that when I started my flexor tendon uh, surgery in the first 20 years of my practice, my results really sucked. They were not very good. Uh, but in the last, well, since 2000 anyway, so the last 20 years, the results have really been amazingly good. It's almost like free flap surgery when it went from the days of not necessarily being very good to today where the results are consistent. And we're almost getting no rupture and no tenolysis using wide awake solid repairs with adequate pulley venting today. And I'm gonna tell you how we got there and hopefully help you to get there too. The first thing is uh, significant and appropriate pulley venting. So we used to think you can't vent A4. So on the left, you've seen A4 completely cut and there's no clinically significant bow stringing on the table. And it's the same patient after surgery on the right with no clinically significant bow stringing after the surgery. And I could show you hundreds of these and there are many papers written on this. This is the A2 pulley, and you're looking at the tendons caught in an awake patient on the proximal part of the A2 pulley, courtesy of Julian Escobar from Columbia. And so what Julian did was he vented the proximal half of his A2 pulley. Now both profundus and superficialis are fitting through quite nicely. And here's the same patient at three months and at one year post-op. And you can see that there's no clinically significant bow stringing either on the table during the surgery or after the surgery. And you can vent the A2 pulley. This is a very important paper written only four years ago in 2016 by Dr. Maria from Japan. But you should read it. He vented the A2 pulley in 40 cases, seven cases of complete A2 venting, 33 cases of partial A2 venting like you just saw from South America. Not one case of clinically significant bowstring. And that takes us to this paper by Jin Bo Tang in 2017. This is a must read paper. It's clinics in hand surgery, and it's 300 tendons by young surgeons, one rupture, and 85% good to excellent results in all young surgeons in three different hospitals. And they have gone on the new rule, which is vent up to one and a half to two centimeters of pulley to avoid clinically significant bowstringing. Forget the old don't vent A2, A4 rule. They are gone. The new rule is one and a half to two centimeters because if you, uh, if you vent in, in long fingers, you've got uh, two centimeters. In short fingers, one and a half centimeters is plenty so that the 
repair can go up and down in unvented pulley and not get caught so that you don't get stuck, so you don't need a Tino license. And uh, so long fingers, two centimeters, shorter fingers, a centimeter and a half. And if you do that rule, you're never going to vent A2 and A4 at the same time. You're unlikely to vent the entire A2 pulley because it tends to be longer than that. And you're not going to get clinically significant bowstring. And this is just as important as wide awake flexor tendon repair to get better results. Complete preservation of the A2 and A4 pulleys gave us 50 years of unnecessary rupture in teno and tenolysis. And wide awake surgery has helped us prove that pulley venting is safe. So this is how we do it today. You'll see my knife there, I'm cutting the A4 pulley. And then I put in my first core suture, and then I test my repair. And I look and see what more pulley I need to vent. So I incrementally vent a little more. Now I'm gonna cut a little more cruciate pulley because it's in the way. I don't just whack out the pulleys. I cut a little more and a little more until I have unencumbered movement. And so in this case, you see, even though I have vented A4, I was able to preserve A3. There was no clinically significant bow strain on the table. And this is the same patient at three months after surgery with no clinically significant bow strain. Now today in that Jen Botang paper in 2017 that I said is a must read, this is a good repair. It's not it's a bulky repair with 10 to 30% extra bulking that easily fits through this one and a half to two centimeters of vented pulley. You've got at least a one centimeter bite and it's a solid repair. And I like to use the uh, Jin Botang six strand repair that's a loop suture. But I don't think it matters about the suture you got to have at least four strands and it's got to be a solid repair and a little bulky is good and I'll show you why. On the left you see what I now call a grandma kiss repair and I'm embarrassed to say that I published this image. It's not a good repair. I used to think that grandma, just like kissing your grandmother on the cheek, you know, is just touching the tendon ends just touching. I used to think that was a good repair because I had to fit through underneath the darned A2 and A4 pulleys. Uh, the problem with the grandma kiss repair is that it often comes apart. In fact, it comes apart 7% of the time. We proved that in a series of 100 wide awake repairs that we did. So a bulky repair is good in 2020. A grandma kiss repair is not good in 2020 and I'm going to show you why. This is a grandma kiss repair. It looks beautiful in this prone patient who's awake. Now she's going to test it. You see how nicely that repair looks? It looks beautiful but it's just barely kissing. Now when the patient puts the active forces of flexion, look what happens. You get a gap. And that happens 7% of the time. And that's why I used to get 7% more ruptures than I get today. But in her case, I fixed the gap. So she did not go on to rupture. So how do you fix the gap when that happens? You put in your second core suture and this time make it tight enough, make it bulky this time. And now you leave your ends long of that second core suture. Your first core suture is now too loose. So now you pull on it so that it gets tight. You don't take it out. You don't damage the tendon again. Just pull on it. Now that loose second core suture, you tie to the long ends of the first core suture. So now you have a solid four strand repair, but you've only beat up the tendon twice. You have to be polite to tissues that you're asking to heal. Don't grab them and beat them up. Then the next important part is full fist flexion and extension testing. 
take that finger and thumb through a full range of flexion and extension. If you're going to get a gap, you want to see that today. You don't want that gap to rupture next week or in two weeks. And you can repair the gap if it happens. This is like doing a vascular anastomosis. You don't just do the anastomosis and close the skin. No, you test the blood flow. You make sure that it's working well. You make sure that there's no gap. And you make sure that that repair fits through between the space in your pulleys, the one and a half to two centimeters of vented pulley. And that's how you avoid rupture. And that's how you avoid tenolysis. It's also taught us a lot about hand therapy. So today, what we do, there's a patient during surgery at four days doing up to half a fist of true active movement, as was started in Ireland and now through most of Europe and China and Australia and New Zealand. Um, and this is the patient at six weeks. So no more Kleinert rubber band, no more full fist place and hold. And I'm going to show you why. If you want to see exactly what we do, we do pretty much the same thing as in Jen Botang's 2017 paper. You can Google the St. John Flexor Tendon Rehab. And it's also on the wallet.surgery website for those of you who want free papers and videos and PowerPoints on uh, wallet surgery. So here's a patient who's just had his flexor repaired. With true active movement, you see beautiful gliding. And you see a little bit of bowstringing, but not clinically significant. When you passively flex it, it stops moving at half a fist. And now it's buckling, buckling, buckling. And I say to the patient, hold it and watch it jerk right there. That's when the patient holds it. I'm going to show you that again. We assumed that when you passively moved it, it moves. It stops moving at half a fist. And when you say to the patient, hold it, it jerks right there. You don't want to buckle and jerk your freshly repaired flexor tendon. And so you don't need to, um, it's, if you do up to half a fist, that's all you need. We've published many videos that show that half a fist give you five to 15 millimeters of tendon glide. That's all you need. And Jin Botang has shown that the repair is most likely to rupture in the last half of a fist because that's where the greatest friction is, the greatest work of flexion. And so don't do that last half of a fist. If you insist on full fist place and hold, at least do half a fist place and hold. But true active up to half a fist is a better way to go. So let me explain the theory of the movement that we're going to do when Amanda starts you moving on Friday. The goal is to move it just a little bit so it doesn't get stuck, but not to move it too much so that it rips apart. It doesn't take much to rip this apart because the stitches are only about one-tenth as strong as your tendon. You're not going to use it at all. You're just going to move it just enough to keep it moving so it doesn't get stuck. What's the most important rule when we get you to start moving it? I can move it, but I can't use it. The important rule when you start moving it on Friday, I can move it, but I can't use it. They have to say that three times before they can go home. You know, it's a great opportunity to teach patients during the surgery. One of the most important benefits of WALAD is I get an hour to an hour and a half to tell my patient what to do and what not to do so that I don't have complications like rupture and like tenolysis. Instead of sitting around and talking to the nurses about the weather, one of my favorite questions to patients is, so, what were you planning to do this week? Oh, I'm going to Florida to play golf with my friends. Well, that might not be a good idea. Let me explain why. So if 
when you tell patients things, they're far more likely to listen to surgeons than they are to read a pamphlet and believe what the pamphlet says. And you can interact with them. Intraoperative education is one of the most important parts of flexor tendon repair. Another important part is this. This is a relative motion flexion splint. It keeps the MP joint more flexed than the other fingers. We have the patients wear this full time. Two weeks after wearing this 24 seven, he's gained 20 degrees of active extension of the PIP joint because of his extensor lag. Patients don't stop living to exercise. When they wear these splints, they're exercising while they're living. I'm gonna show these splints and how useful they are in boutonniere in a minute. Thank you, Gwen Van Strien, for teaching me that. So here's a patient with a typical wide awake flexor tendon repair. We vented his A4 pulley. Uh, and he's got beautiful early movement at four days. And we even have them doing these non-forceful turning a wine glass around. Uh, and there's his beautiful gliding at two weeks and everybody's happy. But what frequently happens is that at four weeks or later, they get stuck. But we ultrasound these patients in our clinic. And the ultrasound showed us that our tendon repair was intact. And so what we do is we put him in a relative motion extension splint that keeps that finger more extended than the other fingers. And what that does is it puts a torque on the profundus tendon and takes it apart from the superficialis in scar. And if you take a pen and do that to your own finger, you'll see how that works. And there's his result at two weeks after, or two years after surgery. So a lot of patients that we used to do tenolysis on, now we do relative motion extension splinting and they take themselves out of scar. So I'm a lot less likely to do tenolysis. In fact, that's one of the reasons I hardly have to do it anymore. I want to show you how useful ultrasound is. This is from Xavier Giffier from France. And uh, what he shows here is the flexor tendon. And I want to show you uh, what it looks like. So this is the proximal phalanx. This is the distal phalanx of the thumb. And there's the metacarpal. This dark area is the empty tendon sheath. The yellow is the ruptured profundus or FPL, flexor pollicis longus. Now that you know what you're looking at, I'm just gonna take you through and show you what it looks like. See, that's the tendon, now you can see it. It's got those long filaments in it. And there's the distal stump, rounded. And there's the proximal stump, right there, rounded, right there. And, you know, when you look at these things moving in video, you can see everything moving. And so everybody, I think that hand surgeons in the future will have an ultrasound probe around their neck like cardiologists have stethoscopes now. I bought my own ultrasound probe for less than $3,000. It fits into my iPhone and I have it with me everywhere I go. They're so useful, but to tell if a tendon's ruptured or not, my therapists use the ultrasound probe on patients and the patients move their own tendons. They can see their tendon moving in the sheath when it's stuck. It helps them to do their therapy. So in summary, the seven most important things to consistently get good results with clean cut flexor tendon repairs or at least a four strand, very solid repair with one centimeter bites that's a little bit bulky. Judiciously vent up to one and a half to two centimeters of pulleys. Full fist flexion and extension testing so that you can fix gaps and avoid rupture and avoid tenolysis because you make sure your pulleys are properly vented. Intraoperative patient education, perhaps that should be number one up to half a fist of true active movement post-op 
and relative motion splints to improve flexor and extensor lag. This is a spaghetti forearm, Chao Chen from China, who taught me something last September that I didn't know. And it's tough to know which muscle belongs to which tendon. And you can ask the patient, okay, flex your long finger. And the muscle belly of the long finger moves a little more than the others. And that's helpful, but it's still tough to tell. So one thing that Chao Chen taught me in the fall is this. When you pull on the muscle stump, ask the patient, which finger am I pulling on? And the patient will easily say, oh, that's my index finger. Oh, no, now you're pulling on my little finger. Uh, and that is a very helpful thing. The patient's awake, so they can help you identify by you pulling proximal, you pulling the proximal tendon, and they'll tell you which finger you're pulling because they can feel it. So let's move to extensor tendons. And what are the two real problems in extensor tendon repair? Once again, adhesions that lead to stiff fingers. And secondly, boutonnieres are hard to treat. So I'm gonna show you some things that might help today. One thing is when you're doing an extensor tendon repair and the patient pulls against you, it's hard to pull the tendon out sometimes. And so you ask the patient to flex the finger. If the patient flexes the finger, the extensor relaxes and you can pull the tendon out. So he's asking the patient to flex the finger and the extensor comes out easily. It's a spinal cord reflex. They can't help it. And if you're doing a flexor tendon repair, you ask the patient to extend the finger and the flexor will reflexly relax. It's a spinal cord injury or a spinal cord reflex. They can't help it. And this is a relative motion extension splint. And this has really helped with extensor tendon repair over the MP joint and on the hand because patients can go to work as early as three to five days after a tendon repair with one of these splints. And I've been using these for over 20 years uh, and I haven't had a rupture yet. So this is how we do it. This is uh, we're repairing the extensor tendon and we're simulating a relative motion extension splint in the operating room. And one of the ways that these work is they decrease the excursion of the injured tendon. So it moves, but not as much as a normal tendon would. And so it takes all of the tension off of that tendon. And so we started moving this patient at three days after surgery. He's totally off all pain medicine. And here he is at uh, 14 days after surgery, ready to go back to work at 16 days after surgery. And he is a workman's compensation patient. But patients can work with these splints uh, because they take the tension off the repair and they uh, end up uh, letting patients get back to earning money and so on. Here's the same patient seven months after surgery. This is Wendell Merritt, who is showing you how this works in a cadaver. So he's the guy who invented the splint. So he lacerates the long extensor of the long finger. And then he puts the cadaver in a relative motion extension splint. And then he puts a single 6-0 nylon suture in the tendon. In other words, he's not really repairing it. He's just putting air there. And then he pulls on the muscle belly. And look what happens. His 6-0 nylon is not coming apart. And then he flexes the fingers all down. And look, the 6-0 nylon is still holding. Why is it holding? Because the long finger tendon is slack. See how loose that is up above compared to these tendons that are tight? It's loose because this joint is 20 degrees more extended. And so the reason these splints work and don't rip the tendon apart is because the tendon is loose and because you decrease 
the excursion. Here's another example of decreased excursion with the patient awake. This is for a wide awake extensor tendon repair. We put in 15 milliliters of local anesthesia. We repair the tendon. Uh, we examine the tendon, see what it looks like with active movement, and then we put the patient in a relative motion extension splint after three or four days of immobilization, elevation, getting off painkillers. You can put patients in a cast like you've been doing forever for four weeks, but if you have to work after an extensor tendon injury, this is one of Wendell Merritt's earliest patients five days after her extensor tendon repair. You know, if you have to work to support your family, you don't want to spend four weeks in a cast. And this is not going to rupture the tendon and the results are a little better. Now, one of the things that awake surgery helps is to determine whether or not to use a wrist splint or just a relative motion extension splint. So you can use both or just one. And how do you decide that? You decide that during the surgery. So in this patient on the left, after the surgery, I decided to use both a wrist splint and a relative motion extension splint. Why? Because even though the tendon stayed together, when I talked to the patient, he was 18 years old. I just didn't trust him unless I put on a wrist splint. This patient, on the other hand, was an older, reasonable patient that I knew was not going to take his repair apart, just like the fisherman you saw in the earlier slide. And so on this patient, after talking to him at surgery, we decided to just use a relative motion extension splint and he ended up getting a good result. This patient had a really tough problem. He had a brain injury with a kind of a spastic hand and a sagittal band rupture. And so he had this very loud snap every time he tried to extend his finger. I would not have done this patient in the days before I did them awake because the imbalances are very difficult in a brain injury. So we split the long extensor uh, as a hemitendon uh, graft and or flap and we repaired the sagittal band but it became obvious that that wasn't going to solve the problem. We had to also divide the juncture A tendine and we would not have known that unless the patient was awake. After I divide the juncture A tendine for the first time in two years, he's awake and he's able to completely extend the finger without problems. And now he's going to thank us in the operating room. You like it too, eh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, both, uh, we both like it. So, yeah, I'll bet. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. He said, you won't believe how appreciative I am. Thank you very much. It's difficult to understand him because of the brain injury, but uh, you know, for him, this was a really, really big problem. And then we examined the repair and decided that we would put him in both a wrist splint and a relative motion splint for the first month. So there's the wrist splint and the relative motion extension splint for the first four weeks after surgery. And then the second month after surgery, full-time relative motion extension splint so that we protected him okay, for Okay, go ahead and flex and months. extend, please. Yep, open and close, great. No trouble at all, eh? No. No more snapping? No, no, no. And how long is it now? It's a year, right? Yeah, more yeah. than a year. More than a year. Never mm. snapped since no. then. No. Great. And you can treat sagittal band ruptures if they're acute with no surgery, just a relative motion extension splint. You don't need to operate on these patients. They heal like mallet fingers after two months of relative motion extension splinting.
Now, boutonnieres are a real problem and relative motion flexion splints. So this splint does the opposite of what you've just seen. This keeps the MP joint more flexed than the other joints. Relative motion flexion splints has revolutionized boutonniere treatments in our hands. And most patients I have found don't need surgery. I can treat most of them successfully without surgery. And so this is a chronic boutonniere that I saw in March. And here he is in July after relative motion flexion uh, splint treatment. And I'm gonna show you exactly what we did for him. First, we serially casted him until the PIP extended and the DIP flexed completely. Then we put him in for two months in one of these on the right, and that's PIP extension that lets the DIP flex inside a relative motion flexion splint. You've got to keep that MP joint flexed. And then two months of pure relative motion flexion splinting. Now, this is Egemen Ihan's uh, video. He's actually on the call from Turkey. And what technique that uh, Egemen used was, there's the loss of substance. He used the method of snow, which is a distally based tendon flap that's flipped down and reconstructing the extensor tendon. But the important part is that he adjusts the tension for that and looks at that at the time of surgery. And now he's simulating a relative motion flexion splint. He's getting full extension. He rehabilitates the patient with relative motion flexion splinting. And here's the patient at four weeks post-op. And then here's the patient at 10 weeks post-op. And this is a spectacular result. Egemen has done this a number of times and he's to be congratulated for combining wide awake um, boutonniere reconstruction with relative motion flexion splitting. So here's the central slip. Are you shooting? Great. Here's the central slip. This is how these splits work. I've created a boutonniere in a cadaver. And here's the lateral slip, lateral slip of the long extensor coming into the lateral band right here. There's the lateral band, and this and we have the same on the other side. There's the lateral band. There's the lateral slip of the long extensor going into the lateral band. Right there, still intact. Right there, lateral slip of the long extensor. And then here's the long extensor going to the central slip, which is now cut. So we've created a boutonniere. And when we extend, there we go. So the boutonniere is obvious when the MP joint is hyperextended. And there's a great resistance there when the MP is extended, but when the MP is flexed with a relative motion flexion splint like this, we see that the finger goes straight. Lateral bands, you might want to get right on top, Cassie, to see those lateral bands. Lateral bands go come back over top of the uh, PIP joint. And so all of this is going to scar over two or three months, just like a mallet finger if you have a relative motion flexion splint full time for yes. uh, three months. So the key there is to keep that MP joint down. If you keep the MP joint flexed, the lateral bands will scar here just like a mallet. So here's the central slip. But you have to keep it that way for two months. So MP flexion is good for boutonnieres because the long extensor lateral slips pull those lateral bands dorsally, just like you just saw. And the intrinsics relax and let those lateral bands go dorsal. So this trap closes and locks the PIP joint inside. 
MP extension is bad for boutonnieres because those long extensors relax and they don't pull the lateral band dorsal to the axis of the PIP joint. And the intrinsics tighten and pull the lateral bands volar so the trap opens and the PIP joint herniates through. So I'm gonna show you a clinical case where we rescued this lady who's 83 years old, who had two acute central slip injuries. We stopped her from having a boutonniere. And so in the procedure room, outside the main operating room, we tacked the finger, the skin over top of this exposed joint. You're looking inside the joint. The central slip is gone. The cartilage over the head of the proximal phalanx is denuded, and the two lateral bands are clearly exposed. There's not enough skin to cover the tendons or the joint. She's got the same problem in the other finger, not quite as bad. But that joint, tendon, and bone will cover with live tissue if you don't let it dry and die. So daily tap water cleaning, Vaseline and Coban tape right on the Vaseline is what we did for this lady. She lives by herself, 83 years old. Once a day, she came into hospital for the first week and the therapists changed the Coban. Then she did it by herself. Here she is at one week, no boutonniere still, and you can see that the granulation tissue is starting to form over the exposed tendon and joint and bone. The skin is a little macerated or white, but that's okay. Whales live that way. Here she is at six weeks, all healed, and at five months, no boutonniere, full range of motion, never went to the operating room, just had her skin tacked down in our clinic and relative motion flexion splinting. This is a case from Chow Chen, the gentleman who showed me the trick about pulling on the proximal muscle. This patient is actually missing a piece of extensor tendon. And so what he does is he puts a suture in the gap and now he's testing the movement with just the suture in the gap. And he measures how much tendon that he's going to need as a graft. And he takes, there's the suture, and he's missing probably two centimeters. You see the suture, there's the gap, there's his palmaris longus tendon graft. And then he sews in the tendon graft and makes sure that the tension is correct. For tendon transfers, tendon grafts, the awake patient is much better than the asleep patient because they can tell you whether you have the tension right or not. This is a more complex case with a fracture of two bones from an ax injury that also cut the tendon. So 20 milliliters of local volarly, 20 milliliters dorsally. We K-wired the two fractures. We repaired the extensor tendon, and here he is one week after the repair. And we're telling him that he can move it a little bit, but he can't use it. We just want him to keep that tendon moving just enough so that it doesn't get stuck. He doesn't need to make a full fist. He's off all painkillers, so he knows what hurts, and he just can't do what hurts. And if you don't do what hurts, you're not going to get uh, K-wire infections if they're sticking out of the bone. Here he is three months after his injury, and he's got pretty good flexion of the MP joint, but he has an extensor leg of the PIP joint, just like a boutonniere. And so we build him a relative motion flexion splint to improve the extensor leg, and here he is at three years after his injury. These recent developments in extensor tendon management were published by Wendell Merrick uh, and myself 
He's the fellow who invented the relative motion splints. This just came out in PRS uh, last month or two months ago. So now we're going to talk about fractures and stiffness in finger fractures. And these are the real problems uh, that lead to stiff fingers after fracture. Prolonged immobilization, open reduction instead of closed reduction with K-wires. And many patients don't follow pain-guided healing. So here's how you get around these problems with wide awake surgery so you don't get stiffness. How do you avoid stiffness? Don't open the fracture. So when we open the fracture, I love to do it. You love to see that anatomy, but what happens to all that space? It fills with blood. Blood under periosteum turns to clot. That turns to callus and scar. And every time I open a fracture, especially a PIP joint, I know that patient's going to take at least three or four months to give more to give me a full fist than if I did it closed. So whenever I can do a fracture closed with a K wire and not open it up, I don't open it. And most white haired surgeons that I know stopped plating years ago, guys like Peter Stern in the United States and many other surgeons. And most of us just use K wires closed. And I'm willing to accept good movement rather than a perfect x-ray. So this is a two-week-old injury that I K-wired closed. I resisted the temptation to open it because on the operating table, after I put the K-wires in, the awake patient gave me a beautiful range of motion and the joint looked good. So I said, stop here, I'm not opening it. Here's another case where I accepted a less than perfect x-ray to get great movement. Once again, the joint was good. His movement on the operating table was 100%. I did not open it. And here's a third one. In this case, the joint isn't quite perfect, but the movement on the table was good. And here he is post-op with a great range of motion. So even if the joint is almost perfect, I'll accept it. So early protected movement with K-wires, I think, are just as important in finger fractures as they are, as it is in flexor tendon repair. I think you should be sending your patients to your therapists at three to five days after K-wiring. Tell them to get off all painkillers so that they know what hurts. This is pain guided healing. And if they don't do what hurts, they're not going to take your fracture apart and they're not going to get K-wire infections. And while you're operating on them, you can see if your K-wire stability is enough to allow half a fist. So you make them do a full fist. So here I got two K-wires in, it's stable enough he can easily do just a little bit of movement, not even half a fist. You only need 15 to 20 degrees of IP joint movement. You just don't want it to get stuck. So here he is at 10 days after surgery. He started moving at three days. And straighten. Lovely. Does that hurt? Uh, it's, it's getting to the point where it hurts, yeah. I push it to that point, but I don't push it beyond that. Perfect. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to hear. And when I can press on the fracture and it doesn't hurt at all, as in this man who's in his 60s at two and a half weeks, that's when I pull out the K-wires. When the fracture is no longer sore to palpation, it's healed. And that's when you can pull out your K-wires if you didn't open it. If you opened it, now you've taken away the blood supply to the fracture. So you need to leave your K-wires in longer. So in this case, he fractured three fingers. Two of them needed K-wires. 10 cc's in the palm, the rest on the dorsum. Start with two K-wires. Check full fist flexion and extension. It's stable enough. You don't need to add another K-wire. If it's not stable, I'll add another K-wire. And at the end of the case, this patient sits up, 
And I ask him if he's sore. He says, nope. It's Friday morning. He's coming back on Monday morning, totally off Advil Tylenol. His hand won't be swollen because he's been instructed to keep his hand up. Here he is on Monday morning, and our therapist starts with teaching him early protected movement. Just don't do what hurts. Move it just a little bit so it doesn't get stuck. You protect the bone that's broken. You don't press where the K-wires are. You press where they're not. And you just get him to move a little bit so he doesn't get stuck. And here's the patient at six weeks after surgery. We've been doing this for over 20 years in St. John, and I can tell you that it works very well. You should consider trying it. Here's another case with dorsal fracture dislocation. I like blocking K-wires, dorsal blocking K-wires, so that I can do it closed. Once again, early protected movement at four days post-op, and here's the patient at six months. Early protected movement doesn't mean immediate. You got to leave the hand up for the first three to five days because if they walk around with their hand down, it's going to bleed inside. That blood turns to clot. The clot turns to scar. You don't have to move it right away because collagen formation doesn't start until day three. Let the patient come off painkillers. Let the swelling come down. Let the work of flexion come down. Let friction come down. Whether it's a K-wired finger fracture or a flexor tendon repair, you treat them the same way. And then they don't do what hurts and they just keep it moving a little bit so they don't get stuck. A final case, and here we K-wire the middle phalanx fracture check the stability. All I needed was two K wires in this case. I didn't have to add a third one. And start early protected movement at three days. Don't do what hurts. We took out the K wires at two weeks when the fracture was no longer sore to palpation. And here she is at six months post-op. A very important point. X-ray healing is useless in finger fractures. And what's more important is, does it hurt when you press on it? And so when somebody comes in with a boxer's fracture, I go to their normal hand and I press on it. And I say, when you can press really hard on your broken hand like that, and it doesn't hurt at all, your bone is healed. So until it's healed, you protect it. While it's healing, while it's still sore when you press on it, you wear your removable protection. I do not operate on spiral metacarpal fractures if they come in looking like this. So I get them to move and if they're not scissoring, I don't operate on them and there's his result at four weeks after fracture. Here's four other patients who did not have surgery because they were not scissoring when I met them. When they came in, they were looking like this. That's the goal of treatment. And we published this long-term result paper and the power is the same in both hands. You don't decrease the power if your metacarpal is a little bit shorter. So what we're gonna do now is get you to sit up, okay? Going to start by putting your hand higher than your heart, starting right now. Just up, kind of like that. And swing down and sit up, my friend. Bring your feet over. How are you feeling? All right. Is it hurting at all? No. Good. Did the whole thing hurt? Or? No, it's just that, that uh, one spot. All right. And when we put the freezing in, how sore was that? Uh, I wasn't sore at all. Okay, good. So we need you to keep it up like that. So the most important rule now is that this hand is on strike. It only does one thing. It stays up here. None of this and none of this. Because both this and this generate bleeding in there and risk moving those little pins apart. These pins are pretty flimsy. Here, hold it in one hand. 
There's, there's nothing to it, right? So you can bend or break this very easily. It's just there to hold it as long as you're not moving. But if you're moving, you're going to move this thing. So we don't want that. So we're going to put you in a splint. And today's uh, Monday. So we'll see you again on Friday. And on Friday, when I see you, I'm going to know if your hand has been up for a week. Because if your hand has been up for a week, all the swelling is going to be gone. It's like a report card. If you've been walking around like this, that's going to work like a football. So we'll know what you've been doing. And we want it up like that so that on, on Friday, we can put a cast on. And what we're going to do is leave that cast on because it takes four to six weeks for one of these to get pretty solid. Your joint looks great right now. And if you look at it, see? It looks perfect. So it'll stay that way as long as you don't mess it up. So, you, you know, whatever you are planning to do in the next month, it ain't going to happen. Okay? Are we good? Yeah. All right. I think that intraoperative education really is probably one of the most um, important parts of wide awake surgery. When somebody's sedated, they don't remember anything. And these patients have a great respect for what we as surgeons have to say, or our therapists. We let our therapists in our procedure room to do the surgery with us. Uh, and so this is also a very helpful technique. Uh, to help patients get better results. So in summary, the four most important principles, I think, to avoid stiffness after finger fractures are, one, do as little dissection as possible to solve the problem. Whenever you can do it closed with K-wires, that's what you should do. Number two, early protected movement is just as important in K-wired finger fractures as it is in flexor tendon repair. Number three, get your patient off all painkillers, including Advil and Tylenol, and explain to them about pain-guided healing. Listen to their body. They didn't spend two billion years evolving pain because it's bad for us. It's nature's only way for your body to say to you, stop that, I'm trying to heal in here, and you're screwing it up. And that's a little voice in your head you want to listen to, but you can't hear it with ibuprofen or Advil or acetaminophen in your ears. And finally, when the patient comes in looking like this, and their joints look okay on x-ray, for God's sake, don't screw it up with surgery. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Lalonde. That was amazing. And amazing case um, examples as well for us to learn from and really demonstrate everything you're saying. So thank you so much. Um, we've had a lot of questions in already, so we'll get straight to it. I think we'll go through the questions for tendons first and then the fractures if we can structure it a little bit. Um, a few people have noted that you keep the patients prone for an FPL repair. Is this something you've been doing for all your patients for FPL repairs? No, Thomas Apart taught me that it's easier to work on thumbs when the patient is prone. And so FPL repair, trigger thumbs, um, you know, it, it really depends if they're comfortable lying on their belly. So if I have a thumb thing to do, I say, are you comfortable lying on your belly? And sometimes I'll actually get on my belly on the stretcher and say, can you lie like this? And then I inject the local anesthesia. And if, they, if they're comfortable in that position, it's easier for me to see the tendon in that position. Amazing, thank you. Um, and we've had a few questions as well asking about whether you use an epitendinous repair or just the Tang six stand repair. Yeah, I do use an epitendinous repair. I want my tendon to look pretty. I don't believe so much in the extra strength that it gives, but I like the, the strands to be touching I always think about how things are gonna heal. And if those collagen strands don't have far to travel, it's good for the myofibroblast. They don't have to take a bus to get to the other end. Amazing. Um, we've had a few questions asking about either delayed presentation of a flexor tendon injury or delayed rupture, say after about four weeks. Um, you touched on this last time, but do you, you just mentioned that you don't like a two-stage tendon repair. What would be your technique at this time um, for these cases? Well, first of all, I don't believe at all in the after three weeks, you can't fix it rule. That's not true at all. 
if the tendon is out to length by the vincula and, and the ends are, you know, maybe this far apart, in a lot of patients, you're going to be able to pull that out. And if you're, if you're gentle and kind and patient and you just pull on the tendon and just let it come out for a while, that muscle will stretch. It's not irretrievably shrunk. You can go in in a wide awake, one year old or two year old case and dig out flexor pollicis longus uh, tendon and get two centimeters of glide. That muscle is okay. So what I do with delayed repairs is I do them awake. I try to get them out to length. And if, if I can get them out to length, I do that. If I can't, then I'll usually do a short tendon graft. Uh, Egeman Ihan, who's on the line, has done wide awake um, lengthening in the forearm. So that's another option. I've never done that, but it's another option. But I, I think that a lot of these cases, you can get them together even at a month or six weeks. Lovely. Um, a few questions from Mr. Darish Nicko, who's a consultant at the Royal Free, asking about your preferred incision for um, a flexor tendon repair, whether you prefer Brunner incision or a mid-lateral, and then he um, tips for limiting the wound extension along the finger um, in terms of identifying the proximal end potentially with ultrasound or making an incision at the A1 pulley instead of unzipping the finger. Right. I think uh, making an incision at the A1 pulley instead of unzipping the finger is a good idea. The more normal skin you can preserve over your tendon, the less scar there is, so the less likely they are to get stuck. So I love that idea. I also like the mid-lateral or the stair step across the crease incision instead of the Brunner. I fell out of love with the Brunner incision one time when I had, I asked my resident to close the skin. He got my, he got the medical student to close the skin and the skin edges looked like that and dehissed. And then I ended up looking at the tendon. If I didn't have a Brunner, if I had a mid-lateral or you know, the square cut, I probably would be looking at less tendon with a dehiscence. So the problem with a Brunner is if you get a dehiscence, it's a pain in the patootie. Thank you. Um, and a, one last question on flexors. Um, do you mind quickly repeating your technique for fixing a gap in the flexor repair with the extra two strands? Not at all, because that's an important thing. So you're doing a flexor tendon repair and 7% uh, of the time you're gonna see a gap form because you, you did a granny kiss repair, a grandma kiss repair instead of a bulky repair. So when you see the gap, you gotta fix it. Otherwise you're gonna get a rupture. So what you do is leave the first loose suture in. Don't redo it because you're gonna beat up the tendon too much. So you put in a second core suture, but this time make the damn thing tight enough. Leave the ends of the suture long when you cut the ends of the suture. So now you've got long ends of the second suture and your first suture is in the tendon too loose. So now you pull on the knot of the first suture and tighten the first suture so that now it's solid in there. Now you have the the ends of the tendon sticking out, the first suture, the ends of the first suture sticking out that's, that was loose and now is tight. So you take that loose first suture tendon end and suture it to the long cut ends of the second core suture. Now you've got two solid sutures in there. And usually what I do for good luck is I put in a third core suture after I've seen it come apart. Nice, thank you. I hope that was useful for everyone who's asked about that there. Um, and now moving on to your use of the relative motion extension splint. Um, a few people have asked, can you use this for multiple fingers at the same time if you repaired the extensor in two fingers perhaps? Yes, you can use it for multiple fingers. It gets trickier though. <laughs> your therapists have to be uh, in, in, ingenious. But I have heard of somebody doing it even with three fingers. I can't imagine that it would work that way. It works quite well with two fingers. With two fingers, it works quite well. But it, that's, that's, that's more about how smart your therapist is. That's not about me. 
And we've got a question from James Chan who asks, how long do you keep the relative motion extension splint on for, for 100% extensor tendon repair in zones five to eight, um, in terms of how many weeks full-time post-operatively? Yeah, I think that up in the forearm, it doesn't matter quite as much because adhesions are not going to make it as stuck, but I still use it because it lets them go back to work. Uh, you know, when I learned how to do extensor tendons at McGill in the 1980s, we did three weeks of in jail splinting and then let them move. And they seemed to do okay without many ruptures. So I kind of was brought up that three weeks, your extensor tendon is pretty solid. So I'd be happy at four weeks of relative motion extension splinting, but my therapists like eight weeks. So I think they're a little bit more conservative than I am. Thank you. Um, a question from Mike Waldrum who asks, would you use a relative flexion splint alone for an open central slip injury? Ah, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, I would. Uh, so when they come in, uh, if they have uh, an acute boutonniere or if they have a central slip injury, I put the pencil there. It's called a pencil test. And when I put the pencil there, if the PIP joint is nice and straight, then I know those lateral bands are going to heal if I keep that like that. And so we just build them a relative motion flexion splint. So, but they have to flex and not have it snap down and stay down, <laughs> right? So, so you try the pencil, get them to flex. And if the PIP joint stays straight, you don't have to do serial casting and you don't have to do uh, full-time PIP extension splinting. You can just do relative motion flexion splinting. That's, thank you for that question. That was a great question. Wendell Merritt, he likes to put everything in relative motion flexion splints right from the beginning. Not everything, but he's more aggressive than I am about that. Lovely, thank you. Um, another question, moving on to fractures now, um, from Mr. Nickar again, who asks, sometimes if you have an open fracture, um, or sorry, a fracture which you have to open, such as a transverse metacarpal fracture, if it's off-ended perhaps, and you cannot reduce this simply with a K-wire, do you have experience of using wallant for plating? Oh, for sure. Uh, you can plate tibias, you can plate radius, clavicle, elbows, you can easily plate metacarpals. And so, you know, you just blow in big volume in the hand, like I talked about last week, just make sure the bone is bathed all around, make sure the periosteum is bathed all around, and you can plate four metacarpals with wallant. Amazing, thank you. And um, a question from Miss Barbara Jemek, um, who asks, what's your infection rate post bony surgery? And do you routinely use antibiotics? Uh, I do not routinely use antibiotics, uh, unless it's a dirty wound, like if I have an open wound, but if I have a closed clean wound, uh, I don't. Our infection rate is very, very low. We're actually studying that right now. Uh, we're doing, th there, there are two papers that have shown uh, uh, with level three evidence that field sterility is all you need to put in K-wires. And we are doing a trans-Canadian study at the moment with 12 different cities, uh, 1,085 K-wires. So far, we're at 900 and something, and no difference in the half that were done in the main operating room with full sterility and half that were done in the minor procedure room with field sterility. But I think if you're gonna put on a plate, I am more comfortable putting it on in the main operating because if you get infection with a plate, that's a big problem. If you get infection with a K-wire, it's really not that big a deal for most people. You pull out the K-wire, you give them IV, or not, you, you give them oral antibiotics. Here's another important thing. You give Keflex, Cephalexin, PO by mouth, the bioavailability is 90%, 90% than if you give it intravenously. <laughs> you don't need to give this stuff intravenously. You can give it to them by pills in your procedure. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of questions um, 
about following on from that? Do you bury your K-wires? That's a great question. Uh, and sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. I like burying K-wires because then they don't irritate the skin as much. I hate burying K-wires because sometimes they get lost and I have to go on a wild goose chase to find them. It's good and bad. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. But I think it really depends on where it is and what kind of patient I have and how hard I think it's going to be to take it out and how much early protected movement I'm going to do uh, and how much I trust the patient with early protected movement. I think all these things play a factor. Thank you. And a follow up on that from Thomas de Kunas asks, what's your skin prep for KY fixation? Right. I, I just use uh, betadine, providine, iodine. You know, I know that chlorhexidine with alcohol may be better, uh, but you know what? The difference is so, come on, really? Prove it to me. Prove it to me. You know, like, so I'm, I'm happy to use uh, providine, iodine. Uh, it's not that expensive. It works. We've been using it for 35 years and the infection rate is we have a question from Neil Cahoon who asks, do you use riveted K wires as opposed to smooth wires to allow early movement? Right, I do not use riveted K wires and smooth K wires do allow early movement and they're a lot easier to take out. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, there's a question from Dr. Ayode. Um, I think you're going to touch on this in a, in a talk with B first, but in a, if you're in a resource poor, resource poor country, with no image intensifier, um, how would you manage fixing a fracture closed? Yeah, that, that was our place before we got a mini C arm in the clinic. And so what we did there was we just would put in the K wires and hope for the best when they were closed. When it was open, it was easy, but hope for the best when it was closed and then send them for an x-ray. But I think there's good news on the horizon. There's a new instrument called a micro C that's coming out that's uh, much cheaper than the mini C arm, less radiation than the mini C arm, and it's just a gun with a back plate and a laptop. And you can carry it around wherever you go. The problem is people are gonna steal it, but it's a lot cheaper than a mini C arm, and I think this is going to be very helpful in developing countries with poorer resources. Thank you very much. And um, we've had a few questions, including from Ms. Barbara Jimmick, about your attire and the patient's attire. Um, the patients, are they in their own clothes or change into a gown? And often, do you stay in your own clothes with gloves or change into scrubs as well? Yeah, I don't think it matters what I'm wearing as long as I don't touch my clothes on the patient. Like if I, if I have a tie, I make sure I tuck it in my shirt. You know, I know in the UK, there's a big deal about ties being, you know, dirty and all that. But really what, it doesn't matter how many germs are on things. It matters how many germs get in the wound, you know. And, and so the evidence, and if you read, we published a paper that just came out in November on evidence-based sterility. And there's really no good evidence showing that a tire is helpful. There's no good evidence showing that a hat is helpful. There's no good evidence or only one paper, and it's not that great, showing that forced air is helpful. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we do. We pray at the altar of full sterility. We treat everybody the same with sterility, but we need evidence-based sterility. That's what we need. We need more papers showing the difference and no difference. And uh, I'm convinced that field sterility for K wires is fine. If I'm putting in uh, plates and screws, personally, I want to put, put that in the main operating room. But I know uh, surgeons elsewhere who put in plates and screws with field sterility. They've been doing it in Calgary, Alberta for 20 years, and they're saying their infection rates are very low. We need evidence. We need to know, not go, oh, this might cause an infection. Well, yeah, the atomic bomb might fall too. We're going to spend billions for nothing. We're going to fill our oceans for, with plastic because we might get an infection when it's like one in a thousand and you take out the stitches and they're fine. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask a couple more questions before passing back to Mr. Harris-Pelina. Um, 
Anil Agarwal asks, um, after flexor tendon repair or fracture repair, if you do get any um, uh, stiffness, significant stiffness of the PIP joint, what's your proposed treatment for that with yourself or your therapist? Yeah, if I end up with stiffness of the PIP joint, so if I have an extensor leg, so I can't quite straighten out the finger because the PIP joint is stuck in flexion, in those situations, I'll use a relative motion flexion splint that promotes PIP extension by stopping MP extension. If I have a flexor leg because they're stuck, then I'll use a relative motion extension splint. And I like the splints because patients exercise while they're living. They don't have to stop being a mechanic to exercise. If they're a mechanic using the splint, and you can operate as a surgeon with a relative motion splint. So you can do most of the stuff that people need to do. They exercise while they're living. To me, those are helpful, along with all of the other things that therapists do. Look, therapists do a lot of stuff, and I'm not going to start pretending I'm a therapist. I'm not that good. Thank you. And just as a last question, we've had a few questions about your use of ultrasound. Um, and in particular, your preferred ultrasound device. And if you can tell us a little bit more information about the portable ultrasound device that attaches to your phone. Yeah, it's called Butterfly. And if you just Google it, it goes on your iPhone. And uh, it was $2,000 American. The catch is you got to buy $500 a year of software. But you got this beautiful device and you can carry it around with you. Look, ultrasound is so good for so many things. It's, it's beautiful for diagnosing neck fash. You know, you can see the pus along the fascial plane. It's beautiful for pus anywhere. Uh, you know, flexor synovitis. It's, it's wonderful to tell if your tendons are uh, ripped apart or not. You can tell if you've got a 70% median nerve laceration as opposed to a 20% median nerve laceration. Uh, you can see if your central slip is actually gone when you are wondering about a boutonniere. Uh, you can, look, um, it just goes on and on. All their collateral ligaments, you can tell if you have a Stenner's lesion or not, whether or not you need to open it or not. You can find your tendon ends when you're going in on any late case you know exactly where they are before you go in. You don't have to go looking for them because you can see them with the ultrasound. It's like looking inside the wound. To be a, a hand surgeon in 2020 without an ultrasound machine today, I'm sorry. You know, And don't be afraid of it. People are afraid because they look at still images and they can't see a thing. Either can I. But if you have the hand moving, all of a sudden you go, oh, there's the phalanx. Oh, there's the tendon. Oh my gosh, that's the median nerve because it looks different than the tendons. And you go, and look, you can learn this stuff in three minutes if you know your hand and that. It's not hard to learn ultrasound. Just get one, play with it, use it, take it home. When you're watching commercials, play with your hand. <laughs> You'll figure it out. <laughs> That's great advice. I think yeah, we all need to become proficient in ultrasound because that would make our lives a lot easier. Um, sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Lalonde. That was amazing. Once again, um, we really appreciate it and your time to take the questions as well. So thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. I'll pass back to Mr. Heras Pelu um, to finish off. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Dimitris. Don, thank you very much. That was, that was excellent. That was one of these talks that was entertaining, educational, and that changes practice. Uh, when we did the survey, over 300 people voted, 90% of them feel uh, they are uh, more likely to do flex tendon repairs than the local, and 78% think they are more likely to do fracture fixation or fracture open reduction and, and the local anesthetic. So I think you are, you are influencing Can practice. Can I just make one comment about that? Certainly. Now, if you do one flexor tendon awake, you're not going back. Because everybody's the same. If you talk to any surgeon, is it well, unless you're one of those people who really doesn't like talking to people, some, <laughs> some surgeons don't like talking to people. Wide awake surgery is not for you. you well, there's some patients that talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> that too. But, but it is good. The educational part of the procedure is very important. No, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Don has done not one but two talks. 
uh, we have recorded them. They'll be available from the Pulbata Hand Center website. And I've put the, the exact address on the talk. You'll find it there you want to link. The one from last week is already there. And the one from today will be, will be ready by, by tomorrow. Uh, we do one of these talks every Monday. And next month, there is one on ultrasound, the user's ultrasound in, in the hand clinic, which will, will be very good. And I just wanted to remind you that uh, next week, we have a fantastic talk by another Donald. Uh, Donald Samuel this time, and he's going to talk about biomechanics of the intrinsic muscles. Um, I'll put now the uh, link on the chat. Uh, you should have it there, I think, and uh, people can can register through through that link. Uh, and I just wanted to thank all of you for joining us today. Dimitri is for co-chairing that, and the chap from uh, Plaster UK for helping us organize this. And particularly, Don, you're an absolute star. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a nice evening. Bye now.